this time, I guess, for some of it. Maybe so. Today, Nora is going to speak about uh, the title of the talk is I don't know why they hate us. I don't. I don't think we did anything bad to hurt them. Jewish girls in Toronto, aged 10 to 12, would reflect on their experiences with anti-Semitism. Nora is from the Center of Women's Studies at Boise, or the Ontario Institute for the Study of Education at the University of Toronto, which is the preeminent uh, center on education and has a long history of doing uh, important work and, and actually women's studies too has a strong reputation. Um, so she's currently a scholar there at the Center for Women's Studies at Boise, and her two most recent studies uh, were national studies of Canadian Jewish women and their longitudinal study of uh, Jewish Toronto Jewish girls, which both focused on the experiences with issues of sexism and anti-Semitism. Um, the study resulted in a short documentary film, Jewish Girl Power, which I think we're going to see clips of today. She's also, Laura's also the founder and editor of JewishFiction.net, which is an online journal of contemporary Jewish writing from around the world, and is a member of several committees within the Jewish community and the UJA Federation of uh, Greater Toronto. Uh, she served as an associate, associate professor, professor of social work, and has links to Professor Siegel, who's here, <laughs> uh, and served as a national executive on the Canadian Jewish Congress. Her PhD is in social work from the University of Toronto, and she's well published and uh, well known in the Canadian context, and nice to have you here at Yale. Thank Thanks. You so Thanks much. for coming. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for Charles for inviting me. It's a delight to be here. I love the conference in August, and now I'm very happy to be able to share my research with all of you. And I want to thank Lauren for being so incredibly helpful sitting with us. Uh, today I'm going to start off by introducing the film. You're going to see a 13-minute film, and I'll just take five minutes first to introduce it so you know what you're looking at. And then directly after the film, I'll talk to you about the research which the film grew out of. The film only reflects a small part of the research, but I want to show it to you first so you can see what the girls are like and get some flavor for the research that way. Um, just, just what you need to know to watch the film. Um, the film and the research grew out of a previous research study, which was a national study of Canadian Jewish women and their experiences of sexism and anti-Semitism. It was a national study looking at those two elements and looking at the similarities and differences between anti-Semitism and sexism. And there were a lot of findings from that study that were interesting. If you're interested in seeing it, you can read the two main articles about it from my website, morabold.com, and you can read about that study. I won't spend much time on it, but I'll hardly any time on it today. Um, both of these studies were funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. I have to say that to acknowledge that probably. Um, one key finding from the research on Jewish women was that the women who said that they had had um, many anti-Semitic experiences in their lives also scored higher on the Beck Depression inventory than the other women in the study. So we found a direct connection between experiences of anti-Semitism and mental health, and depression specifically, which hadn't been done before. But another finding that came out of this research, which was very interesting, was we asked the women where they had their anti-Semitic experiences, and the second most common place was school. Paula, hi. I didn't see you. Hi. Sorry, I didn't see you. Should take off my glasses. Uh, so this was very shocking, this, the school thing at first. And then I thought, well, it's from the older women in the study because the women were aged 18 to 81. So we assume these are the women who in 1951 or 52 had these experiences. When we looked at the data, we saw actually the younger women were also in that category who were having anti-Semitic experiences in school. So I began to ask around, and if indeed schools were anti-Semitic sites in the contemporary context, and colleagues of mine in the anti-oppression field in the school boards in Toronto said, wow, it, there's so much anti-Semitism, no one wants to touch it. There was mm -hmm. one tiny report written. So I thought it would be important to look into this and see what's happening with 
Jewish girls uh, in a way that would sort of parallel the study on Jewish women. And um, I also thought it would be great to make a film. Do you know the film Seven Up? Mm -hmm. yes. great film. So I thought a Jewish feminist Seven Up would be great. And uh, also I was very concerned by this time about anti-Semitism because in the Jewish women's study I hadn't expected to find that anti-Semitism was the key thing actually. I expected sexism would be. I was horrified by what I found. That's a whole other story. And um, by this time I was very concerned about anti-Semitism and I really didn't want to just write up the results in an academic journal that a certain number of people would see. I thought a film could help give much greater exposure to this problem. So that's why I decided to make a film. And um, the film's been used with children and with young adults and in universities. And if there's any educational purpose to which you would like to put, use the film, please just go ahead and do so, particularly in terms of teaching anti-Semitism. Uh, it's just 13 minutes long. And um, what else do you need to know? It's 13 minutes long because a film like this costs $1,000 a minute to make, and my research had $13,000 left in it. <laughs> so that's not bad. Um, I'm not a filmmaker, so the filmmaker is an Israeli award-winning filmmaker named Eli Tal El from Jerusalem. And uh, he, I, there were originally, in the first of the three years of the research, there were 16 girls, and by the third year, there were 14 girls. He, he said you simply can't make a 13-minute film about 16 girls over a three-year period. People, it will be impossible for the viewer to take anything in. So it ended up being a film about just five girls. Um, and there are also cameo appearances of the other girls, because they were interviewed individually and in focus groups, so you'll see some of the focus group stuff. Anyway, I'm going to let you watch the film, and then afterwards uh, I'll get out of the way so I don't block what I do. Women have grown so much over the years. It's not quite the beginning. And that kind of thing is like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're so cool. Girl power. Women have, yeah. women have yeah. grown yeah. so much over the years. And that kind of thing is like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're so cool. Girl power. <laughs> 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 So here are some of the things these girls say. Give us one pause. I love Jewish girls and I love Jewish women and I want them to be strong and I want them to love themselves for who they are. <laughs> Let's start off by talking about being girls, because that's one of the things that we all have in common. I don't, I don't think it's like totally fair. Sometimes like girls are like, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, but like we do stand up for ourselves. We're definitely bolder than we used to be. Oh, yeah. Because you know, a thousand years ago, women couldn't even even think about applying to a job or something. You know, it was like, this is what you do. This is how you're gonna do it. You know. We're allowed to speak our minds. We're allowed to openly speak and be out in the public and live our own lives. We're not controlled. There's like I, there are, of course women women's rights have gone a lot better. You know we can stick up for ourselves. But simple things as like you see the NBA, they're all men. All the famous athletes are all men. The women don't get the same attention or respect from fans or anything. Also, very religious women, they have to wear wigs and skirts and they can't show any part of their body and they have to sit in a different part of the, the, the shul as the men, you know, they always have to be separate. The men don't have to, they can go out, you know, women are not supposed to be touched because they're supposed to be dirty and like, why should we have that, like, all upon us? They, they tend to uh, get a little more excited about girls than <laughs> girls do about boys. <laughs> I mean, this is just what I've been told. Um. <laughs> Everybody, you like to feel pretty sometimes, you like you want to get attention, but I think I would rather save the baby making for the boys, you know, they could have that. <laughs> Other than to go through puberty like we do. Don't really like that that much, but... Well, boys go through puberty too. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think girls think that their appearance is so much more, like, 
I think they really like take they do take pride in their appearance, but they're they're so conscious of everyone else at the same time. So they they want to fit in for every like with everybody and they want to a lot of people they just want to be the same. So I think you should just be happy in your own skin. But if if that's what's making if that's making a big difference, then I don't know. You should try to fix. It. I don't think surgery is like the right way to go, but but I think you should do it like just for yourself. I don't think you should really do it for anybody else. Yeah, you have to eat healthy and you have to exercise, but you shouldn't be concentrating on this. Like it shouldn't be something that keeps you from doing what a kid should be. It shouldn't be taking away your childhood. Boys usually are more violent. So if you see two people fighting in the hall, they're usually not girls. And girls are, boys are more like physically violent and like offensive and girls are more like verbally offensive, you know? Mm -hmm. So like if two boys are in a fight, they'll probably like kill each other. And if two girls are in a fight, they'll probably just like insult each other and yell at each other. Because girls gossip a lot, right? So if, let's say if a boy had a secret and he told his close guy friend, then it probably wouldn't go very far. But if in my school, if you have a secret, you tell your best friend, in 30 seconds it'll come back to you from the opposite end of the school. Um, well, it could be that girls might have more pressure on them for appearance because like before, before like women had more rights, um, then uh, the parents, well okay, the parents would choose like who would marry each other, well, this is in Judaism, um, but also like the man would probably have more of a say in it than the woman would, mm -hmm. and so he would probably like want a woman who was more attractive, but since she didn't really have a say in it, then she couldn't really say like, oh, he has to be attractive, so then he didn't really have to look nice, but and she did, true. so that she would get picked. Personality is a huge thing for girls, I think maybe a bit more for girls than boys, like if a boy meets, this happens all the time, I yell at my, my boy friends for this, they'll be like, no, my boy, my guy friends, but they'll be like, Oh, she's so hot. I'm like, yeah, she's so mean. Like, no. why would you even say it? Why would you even think yeah, yeah. being her friend? It's like, yeah, she's, she's so mean. And they're like, oh, I don't care. She, look at her. She's hot. Let's just switch to Jewish for a second. How do you feel about being Jewish? It's very, like, involving. There's so much stuff that you can take part of and so many things you can do. And holiday, like, there, it's fun to, like, not just believe it, but, like, be active in what you're doing, so. We're actually told, like, the Torah is always telling us how we should, like, respect their parents, respect other people, and like, um, and just like, be nice to other people. But We've never lived anything different, mm -hmm. so we don't know aside from it. So like, it, we've grown up with it, this is what we're used to. I don't live my life or go through my day thinking of me Jewish. being Jewish, and that other person not being Jewish, or like that person being Jewish. Like, I don't really see it that way. And then when the time comes when I kind of like play out my Jewish part. Like if I have a holiday or something, or I have to, or I'm like practicing for my bat mitzvah, then I kind of see that more. Like I'm not very religious, so I'm actually not religious at all. So. Although I am Jewish, I'm a lot less religious than the rest of the kids in my school. Like, you know? Yeah, so everyone is Jewish, but just different levels. So. When I go through my day, like when we're praying or like learning Torah or something, it's not that I don't feel Jewish, I feel kind of like less Jewish than everyone else. People who are like religiously Jewish, they have like no doubts about the things in the Torah, they just say, that's what God said, that's how it goes. Our Torah says for us to always be kind to people, act like, act like we were in our shoes, or like respect people, and, and like a lot of our Torah is dedicated to just um, being kind and having proper respect for people. A lot of Judaism is based on food. <laughs> and, well, we do eat a lot. And it's... I love, like, the Hebrew studies at school. It's really, I have a really great teacher this year for Talmud and Gemara. Like, it's, it's really hard, but I like learning about things in depth, even though um, some of it's from, like, a long time ago, they don't even apply to us. It's like a different way of thinking. Um, and. But I love like the holidays, I love the so like I really like embrace Jews. I've heard that mainly the people who don't like Jewish people or any pe certain people, I think that if the tables were turned and people didn't like them just because of their religion, they would maybe think differently. They say that we killed Christ, which I don't 
I did that. That should be no reason to hate us. <laughs> Do you think we did? I've heard stories, but I mean, he was Jewish. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I don't know, the people who put him on the cross killed him. We didn't kill him. Do you know who put him on the cross? Was it the Romans? Yeah. Well, there's like all Jewish people are rich, or all Jewish people have big noses, or something like that. That's I I don't understand how all people can like can think that. How some people can think that all Jews are one way. No, and again, like just the kind of jokes. Like sometimes I even make jokes. Like just we always make jokes. It's not something I'm against or anything. It's like oh hey, you know you need to learn to make fun of yourself. If everybody was the same, if there's this perfect image of everything being the same, it takes you back to Holocaust, you take back to Hitler, everybody had to have blonde hair, blue eyes. That's like, who says everybody has to be a certain thing, you know? Everybody has to be different for there to be people. Do you think he would marry someone who's Jewish necessarily? I don't think that would be like an aspect, like I'm not going to say I have to marry someone who's Jewish. I think if I, I'm actually like in love with the person, I'm going to get married to them doesn't have to be like a specific kind of person. Like I don't want to say I'm only going to get married to a person with like this kind of hair and this kind of eyes because then what if I find someone who I like who doesn't have that then I'll kind of feel bad about it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not because I don't want to do intermarriage. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just think it's important. It's such a big part of who we are. So like that, that, I don't see how that would really work otherwise. Yes, I could picture myself marrying a non-Jewish man. I would rather marry someone who is Jewish, but like if if there's someone who's not Jewish who's just like the perfect person for me, then I probably would want to marry them. Maybe, but probably not. Yeah. I don't know. Just I guess that's what I've been brought up, you know. No, if if this film is shown somewhere, this is your chance to tell the world, really, what what it's like. Well, I'm, as I said before, a teenage Canadian Jewish girl, and I expect people to try to understand other people better, to understand that really people are the same inside. I like that there aren't many Jews because it makes me feel special and I just live a regular life. I'm just like any other 13 year old girl who's into school and her friends and fashion. I think non-Jewish people, like a community of mixed cultures and religions, would be more accepting a Jewish person than the Jewish community would accept someone else. And it always used to be when I went to Jewish school that like we weren't even allowed to talk about Halloween, like at all. And if we do, then we'd get like these like laser like looks from our teachers right and like on valentine's day we weren't allowed to make like cards or anything because like teachers would rip them up throw them in the garbage like you don't celebrate that holiday right it's like not good and you're not allowed to sing christmas carol it's just like a song right what makes me angry about judaism is how certain people think that their way is their the right way the traditional way that's right and other people who don't think the same as them are less Jewish. We're all Jewish, we have to stick together, you know? Like, if, if we're ever going to want people to accept us, we have to accept each other. New we God, there can be miracles when you believe the hope is frail, it's hard to care. for the girls, even though they're not talking there uh, very much about anti-Semitism, and they are older in the film than for the rest of the research. They came back to do this particular thing. So, so now I'm going to tell you about the research itself, which it focuses on anti-Semitism specifically. Um,
and what happened was that the, the girls, um, starting at the age 10 and 11, didn't really want to talk about being girls. You're seeing them now at a later date when the issue has become more relevant for them. But what happened was, very early on, this project, which was supposed to parallel the project on Jewish women, uh, became just a study of anti-Semitism, because the girls very much did want to talk about anti-Semitic experiences and about being Jewish, and they didn't want to talk about being girls. And they didn't think there was any sexism in the world. They were very clear about that. That's in the past, a thousand years ago, as you heard. And we can do anything the boys can except sports, but we don't want to do sports anyway, so forget it. That was, suddenly I had sort of half of the research project. So to introduce the research itself, um, as you all know, obviously, anti-Semitism has existed for over 2,000 years. And there are many uh, scholarly attempts to understand the phenomenon. One area that hasn't been empirically explored, however, is the effect of anti-Semitism on contemporary children. And there are many historical accounts of childhoods affected by anti-Semitism, certainly Holocaust memoirs and other such things. Um, but there are no studies that use social science research methods to document and analyze the experience of contemporary Jewish children. And this is, in my view, a significant lacuna, given that anti-Semitism is on the rise around the world, as you know, and has been for the past few decades. Um, in Canada, we have a long history of anti-Semitism, uh, beginning from uh, the very beginning of our history. And recently, in 2008, a national survey found that about two-thirds of the religiously motivated hate crimes in Canada were committed against the Jewish faith. Uh, that Judaism was the most commonly targeted religion, and that that year the number of crimes, 165, represented an increase of 42% over the previous year. Research done by social workers and other mental health professionals shows clearly that children are not immune to the violence that surrounds them, including ethnically related violence. Um, therefore, it's crucial to understand what impact anti-Semitism is having on children now, both to understand it theoretically, but also to be able to help these children cope with what surrounds them. Uh, in terms of the conceptual framework, this research, like the Jewish Women's Study, was, is grounded in Jewish feminist scholarship. We have Paula here, and, uh, a great feminist scholar. And, as I assume you also know, Jewish feminist scholarship focuses on the complex ways that the lives of Jewish women are shaped by the dual oppression of anti-Semitism and sexism. This is part, of course, of the larger feminist literature on dual oppression, which deals with the double vulnerability of being both female and part of any kind of diverse ethnic group, or multiple oppressions, such as ableism, ageism, heterosexism, and so forth. Um, overall, what I wanted to do was qualitatively explore the anti-Semitic experiences of a sample of Canadian Jewish girls, as well as the emotional and psychological impact on them of these experiences, and also whether this was related to any characteristics of their families or their <coughs> schools. For example, was there a subgroup that was more vulnerable because of income or education or neighborhood or something like that? I also wanted to see how this changed over time from age 10 to 12 as the girls mature cognitively, uh, morally, socially, and so forth. Uh, the girls were all 10 years old at the beginning of the research and 12 at its conclusion of these three years. Um, in the Jewish women's study, I found that the women's experiences of sexism and anti-Semitism were significantly related to socioeconomic background and to the amount and kind of Jewish education they received. So in doing this study with the girls, I made sure that eight out of the 16 original girls were from Jewish schools and half from public schools, and that's, we can talk about that, that after if you wish, and also the sample reflected socioeconomic diversity and also religious diversity. I made sure there were orthodox girls in the study, which took some doing to get them. Um, also, with reference to geographical location, all the girls are from Toronto which I felt justified in doing because in the Jewish women's study, uh, no differences were found in the incidence of anti-Semitism by region of the country or province, contrary to previous research. Um, we found that very clearly. 
Uh, just to give you, I'm not going to dwell on methodology and other things in any detail. I want to get to the results, which I think are the most interesting parts. And if you want during the questions and discussion, I can fill in anything you want. Um, I met each girl individually once a year for about an hour, and there were focus groups um, once a year that lasted about an hour and a half. Everything was filmed for the purposes of the film, but unfortunately that, much of that didn't get into the film. At the first interview, the parents filled out a questionnaire about the child, um, including information about income, parents' occupations, if the girl had problems at school, just to give me a general question, a general picture. The girls also filled out something called the CASQ, the Child Attribution Style Questionnaire, which measures children's well-being and takes about 10 minutes to complete. And I did that because I wanted to see if there was any relationship between the anti-Semitic experiences they had and their overall psychological well-being. Um, then the girls, I had this poster made for, you know, it was dealing with 10-year-olds at the beginning, so there were pictures on it and cartoons, and there were 10 top, there were seven topics and the girls had a magic wand, and they got to pick the topics and in which order, which is important in terms of doing research with children. Um, and the topics were friends, family, hobbies, school, being Jewish, being a girl, um, putting down the holidays, hobbies, school, being Jewish, and being a girl, and an eighth topic, the bat mitzvah, as they went into the 12th year. Um, the girls were not asked explicitly about anti-Semitism because 10-year-olds don't know that word. Almost none of the girls knew the word. Instead, they were asked, how do you feel about being Jewish? Parts of this came out, of course. <coughs> what are some of the good things about it, if any? What are some of the bad things about it, if any? Has anything good or bad ever happened to you because you're Jewish? If so, what was it? How did you feel and react at the time? These paralleled the previous studies, questions. If a girl mentioned an incident that she thought was anti-Semitic, she was asked why she thought that happened or why she thought things like this happen in the world. So I wanted to find out not only how they felt, but how they thought about this phenomenon. Uh, towards the end of the interview, they were also asked if 10 is a perfect life and zero is a terrible life, what number would you rate your life right now? Then they were asked why they gave that numerical rating. This question developed just in the course of the first year, so that first year only 12 out of the 16 girls got asked that question. Um, the focus groups also dealt with the same topics, but we had the chance to see how the girls talk to each other about these matters. Uh, and here is a summary of the results. Again, in the paper there's more detail, but in brief. Positive and negative aspects of being Jewish, excluding anti-Semitism. So in order, it's very important when doing research in general, of course, but specifically with children, to understand the context. So that if someone told you about something bad that happened to them, and if this was a child who was always saying bad things were always happening to me, or who lived in a certain neighborhood at a time that certain things were happening in the city, this was important information. So um, the overall context, which is very good news, is that all of the girls throughout all three years felt that being Jewish was overall a good thing, a positive experience. So that you should remember as you listen to some grisly things. Um, they all like the Jewish holidays, family get-togethers, special foods, and especially the presents. Uh, some of them liked, quote, believing in God, and others enjoyed learning history, Jewish history and Jewish languages. One said Hebrew was like having a secret language with her friends at a public school. Um, one girl didn't know the word monotheism, but she, she, liked, she liked Judaism because of monotheism. She said, I like being Jewish because you know there's only one person out there who controls you. And you don't have to worry about praising everything, like a god for every single thing. There's only one. I only have to trust one. She really liked that. So they were very charming, as, as you saw in the film. In terms of the negative aspects of being Jewish, other than anti-Semitism, participants identified four main categories. Remember, they're girls, right? Jewish dietary restrictions, having to keep kosher fast on fast days. They almost all hated Passover foods. Uh, one girl admitted to cheating eating non-kosher food when outside her home. Uh, number two, other religious prohibitions like not traveling on major holidays, so the religious girls um, felt they missed out on some class trips and things like that, not being allowed to pierce your body. One of them wanted to pierce your belly button, whatever. Number three, feeling singled out because you're the only Jew or one of very few Jews in your class or your school. And last, 
them was attending Hebrew school or synagogue, which is, quote, boring. And interestingly, there were differences by religious group for these four comments, but the only one shared by all was number four, bored at shul or Hebrew school. Um, experiences of anti-Semitism. So I divided these girls' experiences into two groups, direct ones, experience, incidents experienced personally by the girls themselves, and indirect experiences, incidents that happen to their relatives, friends, and acquaintances, or in the larger environment. Direct experiences first. Uh, in terms of the direct experiences, there were two incidents described by these girls in each of the first two years of the study, and one incident in the third year, so five in all, that these girls experienced as anti-Semitic. All of these took place in public schools, not surprisingly. In year one, at age 10, a girl heard a group of her classmates saying there was a book about Hitler that they all wanted to read because Hitler was so cool. In the second incident, a girl's music teacher wanted to teach the class a, a Jewish song because it was Hanukkah, and an Iranian girl told the class, I'm not allowed to do a Jewish song. Jews are my enemy. In year two, when the girls were 11, one girl heard a boy in her class tell the rest of the class, referring to her, I don't like her because she's Jewish. Another girl heard offensive comments about Jews. In year three, a girl was sitting next to a classmate who drew a swastika on her hand, on his hand, and showed it to her, clearly intended to shock her. Set. In terms of indirect experiences, girls in all three years reported events that they'd heard about or experienced secondhand through relatives, friends, and acquaintances. Um, they also had, had indirect experiences from the larger environment, but this was a major factor for the girls emotionally only in the first year of the, of the project. During that year, there were three very dramatic anti-Semitic incidents close together in the same weekend in Toronto, uh, all in one weekend in March. Within three days, the window of a synagogue, the windows were smashed, tombstones in a Jewish cemetery were desecrated, uh, destroyed, and half a street in a Jewish neighborhood had its front door spray painted with swastikas. Mm. The girls in this study were very affected by these events, and in the nine <coughs> interviews that took place after this weekend, all the girls brought up at least one of these incidents. Uh, some of them also mentioned with concern the additional fallout from the weekend, like the girls in Jewish school suddenly had guards at school and they weren't allowed to use their cell phones. Two girls were upset about the cemeteries because one of them said she has grandparents in the front row. She had 10 year olds, you know. Uh, but fortunately, their tombstones weren't broken. Two other girls knew um, people living on the street that had the swastikas paint spray painted. Uh, one girl didn't, didn't, couldn't remember the word swastika, and she said her friend's house had been Suzuki. Um, really, you, you listen to these girls, you, had, you couldn't help having all sorts of emotions. Um, another girl alluded to the fact there had been a very high profile murder in Toronto two years before, of an Orthodox Jew um, by a skinhead, which was, it was concluded this was not a hate crime for a variety of reasons, if you like, we can discuss afterwards. But this, it had a tremendous impact, and one girl said she was now scared of what was happening in Toronto. Another girl said she was worried about, quote, the pushing down of the Jew. I was astounded by that phrase. Um, in contrast to year one and year two and year three, there were no such dramatic incidents. And none of the girls mentioned incidents of anti-Semitic vandalism in those interviews. However, two girls did describe disturbing indirect events. In one, a girl was told an anecdote by her Hebrew school teacher. And during the discussion, if you like, we can talk about the role these teachers played and what they were trying to convey exactly. Um, but um, this teacher's father's car needed to be towed, and the tow truck guy came and he was driving him to the place, and the driver said, can we stop for a coffee? And the guy said, no, I just want to get it done, if you don't mind. And then the truck driver's cell phone rang, it was his daughter, and he says, I'm with this guy, I asked if, we, if he wanted to stop at a coffee shop, and the Jew wouldn't even buy me a coffee. So she told this to her class of students, one of the girls was in my study. Uh, in the second incident, there was an Orthodox boy, obviously with a kippah, and he was being kicked by a woman on the bus. She was sitting, and he was standing holding the thing, and she kept kicking him, and he said, please don't kick me. 
and she, can you please stop? And she wouldn't stop. And when he went to get off the bus, she gave him a push and said, move away, Jew boy. Uh, in year three, also a year with nothing particularly dramatic, uh, eight girls described indirect incidents. Uh, one had a Hebrew school teacher, again, uh, who received an anti-Semitic hate call when she picked up the phone at her synagogue, including obscenities, and the statement, you Jews are the fault of every death in the world. Um, another girl knew people who had been called a dirty Jew, and a third girl was told a joke. What's the difference between a Jew and a pizza? Pizzas don't cry in the oven. Um, in year th yeah, these are ch little children telling me this, right? Um, in year three, some of the girls also spoke about anti-Semitism in the large environment, and again, this is consistent with developmental phases. They were, by now, 12 years old and more aware of the world around them. Uh, for example, two girls heard about the Jews in Iran being forced to wear an identifying symbol on their clothing, quote, like a Jewish star. Another girl referred to the fact that, in her view, it was dangerous to be a Jew in Afghanistan nowadays because the country is, quote, strongly anti-Semitic. In these interviews, there were two particular themes that emerged from the girls' comments about anti-Semitism, <coughs> and these were the Holocaust and Israel. Now, I have to stress, I never asked, I never used the word Holocaust, I never asked about World War II, I never brought up history, I never mentioned Israel. All this came completely spontaneously from the girls themselves. Um, this happened more frequently as the girls grew older. In years one and two, a third of the girls related anti-Semitism to the Holocaust. But in year three, more than half of them did this. Similarly, regarding Israel, in years one and two, about a third of the girls related anti-Semitism to Israel. But in year three, this nearly doubled, with almost two-thirds of the girl bringing up Israel. Um, to begin with anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, am I talking too fast? Can you understand? Uh, regarding the Holocaust, one girl in year one, after talking about the anti-Semitic vandalism in Toronto, said, it's like the Holocaust again, and two other girls expressed the same idea. One of these girls went on to say that the Holocaust scares her because I can't believe they did that and stuff, like I could never survive and stuff. In year two, the girl who described the incident with the tow truck driver, after saying that you wouldn't buy me a coffee, she continued. And I have all this, not you didn't see it in a film, but of course it's all film, so I re-watched the film for its sequences. Um, and then she said, this is, which is sad. I was like sad that someone would say something like that, especially like after the Holocaust and like stuff. And also that guy on like the internet denied the Holocaust. I don't know who he is, but I heard it on the radio. Well, the guy with the tow truck, that's not as bad as that, but it's like still, that's how it all started, you know. Like people excluding Jews, like saying bad things about them one by one, and then it got bigger and bigger, and then the concentration camps. Similarly, in year three, the girl who related the story about the anti-Semitic phone call at the synagogue then began talking about an anti-Semitic incident that had happened not long before in France. And then she went on to talk about the Holocaust. So they made these connections repeatedly. And she said, wow, there's people in my area doing this. That's pretty scary, meaning her neighborhood. Like, if this were to happen again, which it could, like, did you hear about that thing in France with the guy who got tortured? These things are still happening. And if it comes back again, I don't know what we're going to be able to deal with it anymore. So many of us are lost. Like, to think six million. You just, how could this many people be lost? Some of these girls seem to have been encouraged to think about the Holocaust by being given books to read it by their teachers and parents, or by being taken to movies, plays, or Holocaust museums. Some of them at quite a young age. There's another conversation to have there. Um, these girls were extremely affected by these experiences. They also seemed, as a result of them, to strongly identify with what happened to, with Jews during the Holocaust, and in some cases to identify especially with Jewish children that, during that period. For example, one girl in, thir in the third year spoke about pictures at a Holocaust museum she saw, including photographs of Nazis making people remove their clothes. And she said if they didn't strip, they'd be killed, or they tested with little boys, like five-year-old boys, to see how long they could go without food. And then it's just disgusting what they did, like to know all these people were Jewish and they were just kids like me. 
In all three years, there were some girls in the study who thought the Holocaust could never happen again. However, others felt it definitely could because, quote, some people don't believe it, don't even believe it happened. Mm -hmm. And even among those who do, quote, many haven't really learned the lesson from it. Anti-Semitism in Israel. In terms of the connection here between anti-Semitism and Israel, Israel was very, very, very much on the minds of the girls in the study. As with the Holocaust, they continually brought this up unsolicited. Uh, in all three years, they recognized that the conflict in Israel was a political problem and a complex one. And different girls in the study had different political perspectives, obviously echoing their parents, at least to a large degree. Uh, basically, though, the girls all saw what was happening in Israel as a Jewish issue and as related to anti-Semitism. For instance, one girl in year one said that Israel keeps getting bombed, quote, because that's the Jewish homeland. Another one offered as an example of anti-Semitism that, quote, a lot of people are having wars with the Jewish people, like in Israel. Many of the girls were worried about the terrorist attacks in Israel. Some of them had families. One girl's father lived there with his new family, uh, divorced family. Um, uh, one girl was going there to have her bat mitzvah. Some of them spent summer camp uh, in their summers there. They had many close ties to Israel. And because of these physical or ideological connections, uh, any attack in Israel was experienced by them as an attack on Jews. Um, in year two, one girl came in for her meeting, her interview, and her older sister, who was a university student, had come home very upset because there was an anti-Israel rally on her campus, and her family understood this to be just straight anti-Semitism. Similarly, in year three, another girl heard from a friend of hers. They were walking in a mall in Toronto, just strolling along, and this friend was wearing a shirt with the insignia of the Israeli army, you know, the IDF shirt. And someone walking by that made a sour face and pointed and a rude gesture. And uh, the girl in the study who heard this story was very upset. She took that as an attack on Israel. And then she said she's no longer going to wear her shirt. She has a similar shirt when she goes to a mall. She doesn't want to call attention to herself. Uh, in year three, two girls in the study actually tried to see, brought up themselves the complexity of the political situation and tried to deal with the competing claims of Jews and Palestinians for the land. So one girl said, in their Bible they kind of think that we're on their land, like it's their land given to them by their people, which it also says in ours, and they can't both be true. We think ours is right, but obviously from their point of view they must think theirs is right. Like we think they're evil because they want to steal our land from us, but they probably think we're evil because we have their land and we won't give it back. Um, two other girls commented on the role played by the Canadian media in influencing the way Canadians regard Israel, such as you don't hear about the good stuff that happens, you only hear the bad things. Uh, they were very, in general, very disturbed about the lack of peace in Israel, and one girl in year one said, everything that's happening in Israel right now makes me really sad that so many people are dying and getting injured with not really a good reason because it's just not right for someone to do such a thing and people shouldn't even think about doing things like that. And my question would be, why were weapons invented? Like, why were guns and bombs and stuff invented in the first place? Because right now, they're not coming to any good use. Out of the mouth of the <laughs> anyway, This view was also echoed by several other girls during these three years. And in year two, two girls out of 15 gave their lives lower ratings, an eight instead of a nine, and a seven and a half to eight instead of a nine, because specifically because of the lack of peace in Israel. Hmm. The Holocaust in Israel. With reference to the connection between Holocaust in Israel, and implicitly this triangle, this three-way connection between anti-Semitism and Holocaust in Israel, uh, the girls, with some of the girls, just kept switching seamlessly back and forth between Holocaust Israel, Holocaust Israel, anti-Semitism. Uh, for example, one girl in year one, talking about the Holocaust, said, I don't think this could happen now, except in Israel. And then went on to talk about the bombs going off there. Another girl in year one says she worries about anti-Semitism and what's happening there, and what's happening to Jews around the world, because like in Israel, like, there's so much bombings and stuff. Well, the Holocaust is obviously worse, but this is still really bad. A third girl referred to a Holocaust book she read where the girl in the story had had her parents taken away and people around her were getting shot. The girl in this study said, 
And sometimes you hear in the news just like people who've done bad stuff to Israel, like if they want the land of Israel, they'll just go to war because they want the land. And then people just, like they just war, use war as a verb, and then people die. Another way in which the Holocaust in Israel were concepted conceptually for some of the girls was through the idea of historical anti-Semitism and the way Jews have often been unjustly blamed for things in the countries in which they've lived. So one girl said she saw Israel's getting the, all the blame for the problems in the region, and then she continued. That's how World War II started, because Hitler convinced Germany that everything that's a problem, that's wrong with the world, is because of the Jews. Like the Russian president or something like that, he told his country that he was really bad and he took advantage. He took the money and everything, and when they complained, he'd say it's all the Jews' fault. Everything that's bad is the Jews'. The associations in these girls' bet minds between anti-Semitism, Israel, and the Holocaust were very, very striking during these interviews, and I'll discuss the implications of that in a minute. The emotional and psychological impact of anti-Semitism on the girls. Um, they had emotional and psychological effects. Um, in all three years talking about any of these kinds of incidents, the girls expressed fear and anxiety and most of them thought it was unlikely anything bad could happen to them in Canada, but some of them felt otherwise. In year one, for example, one girl said she could see something bad happening to her in Canada because she was Jewish. Another girl that year said that as a result of the recent anti-Semitic events in Canada, she's now sometimes a little afraid of people who are not Jewish. A third girl, the one who had the incident with the Iranian girl, said she was sometimes really happy, but sometimes really sad that she's Jewish. In year two, after telling the story about the boy being kicked on the bus, this girl said she was glad that unlike Orthodox Jewish boys with their skull caps, she's not identifiable as a Jew when she goes out in public. She thinks she's safer that way. That same year, another girl talking about her school, a public school, said, I don't point out that like, I'm like a Jewish person. If someone doesn't ask me, I'm not gonna tell everybody I'm Jewish. I don't fully make myself a contact. In year three, one girl, when talking about her public school, said, sometimes I'm scared to tell people they're my religion, because like you never know, like there could be people in the world who are like anti-Semitic. Two other psychological effects were noted as well. One girl in year one showed what I think was evidence of internalized anti-Semitism. I wonder, she said, if I wasn't Jewish, would I make fun of Jewish people? I just wondered that. And in year two, several weeks after her bat mitzvah, which she said was an extremely positive experience for her, one of the highlights of her life, one girl spoke about the possibility of converting to Christianity because of the dangers of anti-Semitism. Quote, sometimes I feel like I want to be Christian because I always hear about like this stuff about like people killing people, killing Jews because they're Jewish. I usually hear about it in Israel, but sometimes like even near me in Toronto, like once I heard about this guy, he shot someone because he saw he was Jewish, so he shot him. The following year, the same girl repeated this idea, saying she could see herself converting at some point in the future, but not at the moment, not yet. When asked what sort of thing in the future might persuade her to convert, the girl answered, well, I know that there's been like some shootings or like in Toronto just because people are Jewish or like they've got like graffiti on some houses. That wouldn't make me convert. But it would make me persuade me a little bit, maybe. Just like safety. In terms of the overall emotional and psychological well-being of the girls, no relationship was found between the CASQ test, the anti-Semitic experiences that they related, the types of school they attended, or their families' religious affiliations. However, there was a relationship between the girls' experiences of anti-Semitism and the ratings they gave their lives just in year one. That was the year with that horrible weekend. Um, in year one, out of the 12 girls who were asked to give their lives a rating, five of them rated their lives lower than they would have otherwise because of anti-Semitism. This appears to be related to that weekend because all five of these girls had interviews that fell after that weekend rather than before. These girls came from both kinds of schools and all religious backgrounds and constituted 55% of the girls interviewed after that weekend. When asked the reason for her lowered rating, one girl who had given her life an eight instead of a 10 said, because I'm really happy about everything that's happening to me in my life, but people for our culture, things aren't so good. 
Someone else who lowered her score said, because of what goes on to people who are Jewish. The fact that five out of 12 10-year-old girls in year one, 41%, rated the quality of their lives lower because of anti-Semitism struck me as disturbing. Now this is how they felt. I asked them how they thought about anti-Semitism. Why do you think it happens? And here are some of their answers. Year one, age 10. People think that they, interesting, she didn't say we, the Jews are lesser people, that we are, then she said that we are lesser people. Someone else, because they have to blame their problems on someone, so they decided on Jews. Another person, because being Jewish, there's always going to be hatred against you. Another one, because they hate Jews, but I don't know why they hate us. I don't think we did anything bad to hurt them. Someone else said, I don't get why people would ever do that just because of a religion. Like, I don't think we're bad or mean or anything like that. Year two, age 11. And you can hear a gradual, some gradual changes. There's always going to be anti-Semitism because some people just feel that way. Like, some people feel we should not be here. They don't like us. They're followers of Hitler. Someone else, I think they have their own problems, and sometimes it's just them. Like, they may be sick. But sometimes it may be just people don't like Jews because of their own reasons, and I don't know what those are. One girl in year two expressed some self-doubt because of anti-Semitism and perhaps some self-blame. She said that when an anti-Semitic incident happens, she asks herself, is there something wrong with us? It's, I asked her if she believes there is. Her answer was equivocal. I'm not really to say, because I haven't learned all the history of our past or our present. I'm not fully in contact with what's happening in Israel, what's going on everywhere, if we've done something to these people. So I don't think I can really like fully answer the question. In year three at age 12, the conceptualization of anti-Semitism reflected these girls' increased intellectual maturity, for example, in the idea of stereotypes. Well, sometimes the anti-Semites have their own particular problems. I don't know what their problems are, but pretty much all in all, they stereotype. They think that all Jews are bad and it's like one Jewish person was mean to them. Like they usually just stereotype one bad person. Another girl said, people just don't like people to be different. Or they just stereotype and they think like all Jewish people are mean or rich or had big noses. That girl said the same thing every year. Uh, <laughs> some of them repeated themselves. Anti-Semitism and other forms of oppression. In year three, these girls' greater intellectual maturity and sophistication was reflected also in the understanding that anti-Semitism is one form of hatred among others. In the first two years of this study, two girls each year showed evidence of this understanding, but by year three, this was manifested in almost half the girls. This ability to see the link between anti-Semitism and other kinds of oppression reflected not only increased intellectual maturity, but also moral development. So for example, in year one, the two girls, this was interesting, who connected anti-Semitism with racism, attended the same Orthodox school, Orthodox Jewish school, and they'd been shown a puppet show about black and Hispanic children getting stereotyped. In Canada, we say black here, I believe we say African American. One of the girls said in that show, a white person told a black person that they were like lesser because they were black. It's so stupid, it's just a pigment. So she said. Then she drew a parallel between racism and ageism. I don't think anyone should be less treated. Well, I think kids are less treated than adults. She's quite right. That's ageism in its pure form. In year two, one girl connected the historical struggle of the Jews with the struggle of black people for their freedom, and it makes her, said it makes her very angry whenever people, any people, quote, aren't treated the same. Another girl in year two talked about going with her class to see a performance by a group of people with disabilities, and in describing it, she related ableism to anti-Semitism and racism. In year three, one girl related anti-Semitism to racism, sexism, and homophobia. She said, discrimination makes me sad against Jewish people and women and other people like Chinese people, black people, native people. And the way the Nazis and some of the Germans treated the Jews was just terrible. And that makes me sad and angry that people could treat other people that way. It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is. They're just people. We're all just people. We're all equal. I don't get how they could feel they're higher than the gypsies and Jews and homosexuals. 
Similarly, another girl in year three speaking about the Holocaust connected this to racism, homophobia, and sexism. It's not just Jews that were affected. All, a lot of other people were affected. Homosexuals, gypsies, and people with special needs were all affected. At the broadest level, of course, they were beginning to talk about hate at this age. This came up explicitly in one of the focus groups in year three, when one girl said it's not possible to get rid of the hate in the world because, quote, even if there are just two people in a store, they'll start fighting, and sooner or later, someone's going to say, I hate you. Another girl said that at school they were discussing to kill a mockingbird and how good it would be if everyone would just accept each other and if there was less hate in the world. Someone else mentioned the book. It was nice to see these kids were reading. Well, they were forced to. They had to read these books for school, but still. They were reading this book called The Giver. Do you know that book? It's mm -hmm. a big book in Canada. Um, and in that book, there's the idea of a pill that could make everybody love each other. In response, one girl said that to make the world perfect, someone would have to put a magic spell on everybody, and then everyone would become nice, and no one would hate anyone anymore. Finally, one girl said, we just need more love in the world and less hate. It seemed very simple to them. Um, similarities and differences by religious background and type of school. No differences at all were found between the girls from the various religious backgrounds. With difference, reference to different type of schools attended, there were no differences there at all, except of course regarding anti-Semitism. If you're in a Jewish school, you don't have direct experiences of anti-Semitism. In terms of developmental similarities, at the beginning of the research, the, when the girls <coughs> were 10, their families, of course, were the main filter through which they experienced anti-Semitism. Um, as it progressed, their peers had more influence, and of course, the internet, the media, and so forth. Comments, discussion. So this research was initiated out of concern for the emotional and psychological well-being of Jewish girls in Canadian public schools based on a finding in another study. Um, I was concerned that anti-Semitism in these places might be putting them at risk. And the findings of this research indicate that to some extent this is the case. All five of the anti-Semitic incidents experienced directly by the girls in the study occurred in public schools. Someone told me public schools in Canada have different meaning than here, so perhaps I should clarify that later. In addition, this research found that indirect incidents of anti-Semitism were experienced by girls from both kinds of schools, public and Jewish. When they expressed these, discussed these incidents, they expressed worry, fear, anxiety, sadness, anger, and self-doubt. In addition, some of them responded to these experiences by trying to hide their Jewishness, internalizing anti-Semitism, or considering converting to Christianity. Over 40% in year one, as I said, lowered their life satisfaction because of anti-Semitism. All of this, in my view, is cause for some concern. So is the fact that as early as age 10, before most of these girls knew the word anti-Semitism, they were aware of this phenomenon, and in varying degrees, worried about it. In that first year and in the two subsequent years, they were able to identify the name, by name those countries where they had heard anti-Semitic incidents occurred, such as Afghanistan, Iran, France, and Russia. And most of these girls hadn't even really started geography at school yet, so that was quite striking. And they also grasped with remarkable acuity that the essential characteristic of today's new anti-Semitism, so to speak, is anti-Israelism. Um, as previously noted, they kept bringing up Israel, they kept bringing up the Holocaust. This connection to the Holocaust, I thought, after these interviews, appeared to be encouraged at Jewish schools and by some of the parents. And although this focus on the Holocaust gave these girls a sense of Jewish history and identity, it also seemed to give them an increased sense of acute personal vulnerability. In addition, it was striking how, for some girls, the Holocaust was a barometer against which they measured their own experiences of anti-Semitism. For example, the Holocaust is obviously worse, but still this is really bad. It gives one pause to think about 10 to 12-year-old girls, really, using the genocide of six million Jews to evaluate things that happened to them at school. Uh, in terms of trying to understand what they meant to them, it seems from the interviews that their two touchstones were Israel and the Holocaust. The Holocaust, on the one hand, perhaps was anti-Semitism past and Israel with its struggles, anti-Semitism present and future. This might explain a little bit, at least somewhat, the traumatic effect of that weekend um, of events. Um, because it could be, for example, that since these events took place in the context of the Second Intifada, 
Um, that was Israel was represented there, and the violence of the Holocaust because it was swastikas actually that were painted on the front doors. So this dual image, both aspects of it of course being about collective annihilation, past or potential, would have greatly intensified the psychological impact of this vandalism on these girls. Uh, in terms of future research, uh, this project was just a first step obviously towards understanding how Jewish girls or children at all experienced and are psychologically affected by anti-Semitism. A lot of additional research, I think, is merited to build on this work. It's recommended that future studies should compare the experiences of Jewish girls and Jewish boys, expand the size of the sample and conduct an international project on Jewish children from many different countries, and employ, as this research did, both qualitative and quantitative methodologies also, there should be a variety of different instruments to measure children's psychological resilience and well-being. It would also be valuable, I think, to compare the anti-Semitic experiences of Jewish children with the ways that non-Jewish children experience other forms of oppression, such as racism. Finally, it is heartening to note, I can't help it, an optimist by nature, it's heartening to note that in spite of their experiences with anti-Semitism and in spite of the occasional ambivalence, the girls, all of the girls in this sample liked and or were proud of being Jewish. This is very important, and we as Jewish adults need to do whatever we can to help Jewish children build on the positive aspects of their Jewish identities rather than inadvertently fostering negative Jewish identity by overemphasizing anti-Semitism in Jewish education or at home. It is challenging, to say the least, to put or keep anti-Semitism in realistic perspective when communicating about this topic with young people, and to help them find a balance between denying and exaggerating this phenomenon. Research like this, however, has a crucial role to play in helping us understand the external reality that surrounds us, the factors related to how Jewish children process this reality, and what we as scholars, parents, and educators can do to protect the next generation of Jewish children and at the same time prepare them. Uh, <clears throat> I really profound. And it's amazing how kids can see, they can kind of cut through it all. And they can see things more clearly sometimes than uh, even scholars. I, I would agree. I was so moved by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was very powerful. <coughs> so the two quick comments are just, um, <coughs> so it's really it's exciting work and important work. and. Uh, it's amazing how young children can see the sort of connection, or feel the connection, or be traumatized by the connection between images from the Holocaust and swastikas and images of Israel. And this is the new anti-Semitism. And so many scholars don't make the connection. And yet children are experiencing it. So this is very powerful to, to show, very important. Um, and just as a footnote to this, and before we open it up, I think it was in 2004, I was visiting Montreal, where I'm originally from, and... As am I. Right, that's right. And um, so I think we grew up at a time when, you know, the quotas were gone and things were kind of open to our generation of Jewish Montrealers, to Canadians. And I remember coming home for a Shabbat dinner, and uh, I was at my sister's house, and um, it was just after the firebombing of the Talmud Torah school. And it was, it was a Jewish school that was firebombed, and the library was destroyed. And I remember, I, I was just starting to deal with these issues of anti-Semitism. I came to my sister's house and she was on the phone speaking to all these women, mothers, who I grew up with, mm. you know, asking them, are you gonna tell the kids or not tell the kids and what to do? And they were sort of strategizing on how to cope with this, you know, disaster. And that's when I decided, well, I have to really do something. So it's interesting, that this experience. So the one, so the one question I have, I'm surprised that there isn't a distinction between what's going on in, in Quebec and the rest of Canada. Because I did research looking at the levels of anti-Semitism and racism and segregation uh, for my doctoral degree since so like 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. But there was a difference between mm -hmm. Quebec and Montreal and the rest of Canada. That there station was. is gone. The, well, there was also, there was that, there were those studies, the book, The Jews in Canada, and it was Bob Brim and, there, and Shafir, and there's this classic study that shows basically Quebec anti-Semitism is worse. I didn't find that, and I looked for it partly because I wanted to refute it, but um, it, it didn't show up. And, you know, as a Montreal, former Montrealer, both of us, you know, there are all these cliches about 
<coughs> francophone versus anglophone anti-Semitism in Canada. And I would say, without being facile about it, I actually prefer the French-Canadian brand. Um, I went to university in, in, uh, in French uh, for one year in a French CGEP. And they were very upfront about it. You can't be Jewish, you don't have horns. They'd never seen a Jew, some of them. These, these were professors. Um, it was different than the British form. So it isn't worse. I think it's just different. And I, was, I kept checking that data because I thought that's so interesting. But it was very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Did the girls whom you interview discuss their concerns and fears with their parents uh, to the same extent that they did with you? Or were you able to elicit more from them than they would have disclosed at home? Well, you know, there's this confidentiality thing in research. So um, even with children, there are certain things you do and don't share. So I did, the, of course, because they were young, I would get to talk to the parents after every interview. But the girl was standing there, and I hadn't been given permission to quote the girl as such. Um, in one particular case, the grandmother of the girl was a Holocaust survivor, and the mother would keep me for an hour after every, you know, she'd come to pick up her daughter ostensibly, and then she would talk to me about anti-Semitism and her mother's experience in the Holocaust. So you could see the influence on that particular girl, and the girl would stand there and listen to these stories and so forth. Um, I don't know how much they told their parents. I mean, certainly when they were 10, it was clear a lot of this was parroting their parents. Um, um, I also knew their backgrounds. You know, there, there's one family in particular where they see the Jewish community as being quite parochial, and they see themselves as superior to it and outside of it, and um, sort of didn't think anti-Semitism was very important. They were more interested in the sexism angle on the study, and they wanted their daughter to be in the film. A number of the parents wanted their daughters to be film stars, because they thought they, this might hit Hollywood. There would be all sorts of reasons, right? So not all the parents were concerned about anti-Semitism. Um, but the other thing that happens in the longitudinal study, which is fascinating, one of many fascinating things, the girls would basically walk in the third year and say, okay, anti-Semitism, sexism, being Jewish, being a girl. Like, they, they already knew what I was going to ask them. And to some extent, of course, that influenced their experience. You know, quote, contaminated the results in the sense that in between first and second year, they weren't consciously saving stories for me, but something happens, right? Um, I went back to film them years later, and I, I still think of this study as being in process, because I would like to revisit them every few years, as in 7-Up, and see, you know, see. But I don't know exactly what they talked about with their parents. I, I do, I mean, you may have picked this up. I was trying to be really discreet on certain points. But I really don't like, you know, trying to give kids an instant Jewish identity by frightening them about the Holocaust. And I felt in one case in particular, it was almost that. Like, the kid didn't seem to really relate to being Jewish, so they took it to a Holocaust museum. And I thought, there are other ways to convey Jewish identity. Um, that's sort of why I, you know, in the film I ask about Jewish identity and intermarriage. There was a whole sort of subtext for me about how anti-Semitism was used uh, in some ways that I had questions about. And, you know, the, the need to achieve some balance with children. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to ask a methodology, methodology sure. question sure. Uh, um, regarding the focus groups. Yes. Uh, this is a very elaborate instrument. It's a fantastic instrument. And um, did you put on one focus group with the 16 girls? Uh, you had several focus mm -hmm. groups? I had two per year. They were in groups of eight. Okay. And um, of course, they hadn't met before the first focus group. Uh -huh. And the groups didn't stay constant because it depended on whether, if it was April 10th and April 17th, whatever suited the family's cardboard. So the girls actually mixed and matched over the years. Okay. And they became quite connected to my great surprise. They were exchanging, not email, something else. Okay. Not Facebook either. They had something else. No, this was pre-tweet. But they had something that I didn't even really use, and they were doing that. 
And what was the frequency? Was it weekly or monthly? Once a year. Once, once a year. Once, once a year, a year okay. that I would meet with them individually. Uh -huh. And then the focus group would always come after because I didn't want the focus groups to influence their individual responses to the questions. Okay. So you had complimentary uh, single interviews with uh, one of uh, with each of the girls? Yes, individual. Okay. I'd have eight okay. individual, mm -hmm. I'd have so. all of them individually, and then two focus groups. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to see that they wouldn't say the same things in the focus group. Yes. Um, and one girl who would, was described herself as so introverted and you and she had no friends and she was depressed and she bloomed in the group I mean who became the leaders in the group you know I had them painting it, you know it was very carefully structured the focus group it wasn't verbal primarily because children do activities that's the way of interaction and um, I was doing all sorts of social work assessments of the girls and in, in their group interaction to compare how they were with me with each other as a way of also contextualizing the responses. Okay. There was also food, which was a big thing at the focus okay. groups. Okay. Because, you know, um, of course, the focus groups, the segments are mostly group related. Now, you know, you're sitting in the focus group and you watch how the other behaves, and, you know, it's all. And so I guess it's always vital to conduct um, a comp on a complementary basis a single interview that you could have a contrast. And, uh, Get another question about um, the experiences with direct anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. uh, these were mostly classroom-related uh, uh, things. Um, and how did the teachers react? How did the teachers react? Did they uh, uh, told? Did they uh, um, the girls told something about the reaction of the teachers and how did they evaluate this? Well, it's interesting, you know, I guess part of it is also what children assume. Do children assume that the teacher will do the right thing? Um, you may have noticed, for example, like in the film, when one of the girls was putting down orthodox girls, and the girl sitting next to her kept looking, she was looking towards me to defend her. She's an amazing girl, that girl. And I had warned her ahead of time because the filmmaker said, you may not rescue the girls. I see how protective you are of them. You cannot rescue them. You need the tension for the film. And I was very uncomfortable about this. And so I told the girls, if there's an argument or something, I'm not going to bail you out. You know? So she knew that. But she was still under attack as an orthodox girl. So to come to your question, I didn't feel, obviously, the girl who was told, you know, it was Christmas and Hanukkah time, and I'm not teaching a Hanukkah song because you're my enemy. It was traumatic because the teacher didn't do anything. I mean, mm -hmm. it, obviously, if the teacher had said, what does that mean if we're not enemies, we're all blah, 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 it wouldn't yeah. have been. Uh, the song didn't get taught. Mm -hmm. um, not at all? Or, oh. Well, she told me the song didn't get taught. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if there were, I think there were phone calls between the parents afterwards. There was also something else with that girl around birthday parties, which are a hugely significant thing at that age. And that girl's mother, after she didn't, the girl in the study had invited the whole class, including that girl, of course, because she's a good girl, you invite everybody. Uh, that girl made a sort of counter party and stole like three quarters of the class. So yeah, so there was a lot of pain around what you do with that. I want to see what the other ones were, just if I can answer. Uh, the book about Hitler that they wanted to read because Hitler was cool, I believe that happened not in front of the teacher, like that was at recess, if I'm not mistaken. And that's on considered part of school, obviously. Uh, I don't like her because she's Jewish. She told the rest of the class, I don't know, I don't know if the teacher was involved. And the classmate with the swastika on his hand, well, I like that, she didn't call the teacher. She didn't tell the teacher. I'm not sure in public schools teachers are perceived as particularly sympathetic or safe, yeah. or particularly yeah. unsympathetic. I guess they're key yeah. figures when it comes to uh, incidents like this. You know, at least they can, uh, if they have knowledge of, of, uh, of, of incidents like these, uh, then they can at least start a discussion. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, uh, sure, a good teacher would say yes. that's grist for the mill. Let's yeah. talk. Yeah, let's talk. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, as a parent who raised a Jewish daughter, both of us, I think I, I could see the parents of these girls while listening to the girls speak, and some of my thought was answered by this gentleman's question in your response, but I felt that these girls were 
highly intelligent and highly sensitized to these issues. And I don't think that comes from themselves. I think it comes from their homes. Mm -hmm. So whether you were able to interview the parents about that or not, it would just be really interesting to know how those Jewish homes differed from non-Jewish homes of the girls' peers, for example, or whether non-Jewish girls were as attuned to any issues in the world as these girls were to both historic issues like the Holocaust and issues about Israel today. But I also thought when I was watching the girls and remembering our own daughter, who would have fit right in with that group, um, it seemed so positive that these girls could become leaders in the Jewish community, or they could become teachers, or social workers, or rabbis, or people who needed to have empathy for others to do whatever they want to do. And it would be very interesting to follow them as they go on to college and into their careers and, and see what they make of that empathy. And I'd love to follow them. I just, if I can just respond to this point about parents. I mean, teachers have a huge amount of power, I mean, implied in your question. And, and I don't know how you all reacted to the teacher who, who told her class about the tow truck incident or, or the hate call, Jews call, or the death, cause all the death in the world. I don't consider that particularly educationally helpful. I mean, you know, you're talking 10 year olds. They, you know, I have all sorts of questions. I'm someone who, by the way, just to put this in context, my son went to Jewish schools all the way through, and I'm a great, I, I greatly respect Jewish educators and Jewish education, so I'm not trashing anything. But I am, I am raising certain questions about what some of these teachers did, and they were basically traumatic for the children. Those were traumatic incidents for the children. Yeah, I, I'm interested in the question of education because uh, uh, one of the things that was done in America is that Holocaust education became part of uh, public school curriculum and it was placed within the context of uh, prejudice, racism, hatred, etc. And it seems to me that that's uh, extraordinarily useful. And I was wondering if there's if you've had any contact with, um, now, I was, to, I will be, <laughs> I was the uh, chair of the education committee of a Jewish day school, and I really opposed too much emphasis on the Holocaust. I felt that there were other things, particularly I'm a historian, there were other parts of history that uh, children should know. Uh, but I do think that educators uh, in public schools uh, and in Jewish schools should become aware of this material. I was wondering if there's any contact or any attempt uh, to have this, uh, this study referred to or uh, develop a curriculum around it uh, for, uh, for uh, middle school students. Uh, that's, well, it's being used in, in a Jewish middle school in Canada, but there is actually, as there is in the, here in the States, there is a whole um, module on Holocaust education as part of teaching about tolerance and multiculturalism and anti-oppression. And there are people doing some of that work at Boise UT, where I'm located, um, in a different department, um, Grace Feuerberger, other people are doing that work. And actually, it's a very good idea to offer them the research as um, George Brown College, which is not a Jewish institution, um, not only um, uses this in its classes on anti-oppression, they made it uh, um, accessible to deaf people and blind people, but not the film, they, they have um, blind people listening to it, uh, and they're very committed to that. But yeah, I think this, this information should be out there much more. Uh, it seems like this information would be useful for the Jewish clergy in Canada as well as uh, Jewish youth leaders in Canada. Uh, I was just thinking about some of your final comments about uh, the positive comments about how these girls did feel proud of being Jewish. 
and that they did seem to have a psychological resilience. Yet, on the other hand, it was disturbing to hear that they had so much negative psychological baggage as a result of what they had been exposed to, uh, probably because they didn't understand that anti-Semitism is the problem of the hater, not the problem of the Jew. But one goes there. Yeah, right, right, right. But, you know, I think the message really has to be transmitted that you need to be a proud Jew, and we've got a great cultural heritage, and we are tolerant, and all these girls were saying how it's great to, you know, look in the Torah and see how we, you know, we, we're welcoming and we respect others, and to say, you know, if somebody voices some hate, that's, it's not my problem, it's not because of the way I am, I don't have to change, it's because of their problem. And that it should raise their self-image, not make them more depressed. I agree with you, and actually this film was used in a summer camp, a Zionist summer camp, uh, shown to 100 kids and led to a discussion. And interestingly, they're, they're, they were very interested in the sexism. The boys' mm -hmm. main response was about sexism and, and all that stuff. But they also did talk about anti-Semitism. Yeah, I think, that, I think there's a whole piece for Jewish kids that needs to be dealt with, and there's a whole piece for the larger community as well. Um, I have a question uh, concerning the education. Okay. Is the Holocaust education in January? Like, does it have to be included in the curriculum of public schools? Like it is in many European countries? I think they have to have one one lecture or something like that. I don't think it's a, it's in depth. I think there's one lecture that's required, and then there's an elective, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. It's not. There's a program called um, oh, I forget the name of it. It's a whole module, and it's a booklet, and it's available to public school teachers if they want to take it, but, but they don't have. Just a general remark that um, the question of uh, anti-Semitism in Canada and especially in Canadian schools is very often brought into the consideration of the uh, United Nations Human Rights Committee. Every time the um, report from Canada comes, there is this question discussed because this is, this is seen as a big problem so, yeah. in the United, United States Human Rights Committee. There is a famous case, Rose Against Canada. Yeah. Uh, there was a teacher, mm -hmm. um, very <coughs> anti-Semitic, yeah. and he brought the case against it his country because he thought his freedom of speech was violated and um, it's very interesting to read the conclusions of the Human Rights Committee. Uh, they are very, very strong and um, of course they said that his rights were not violated, that actually Canada had the obligation to, 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 um, to provide his, his speech. So. Really? Mm -hmm. That's good. They sometimes do the right thing. It, it's interesting though that at Yale, for example, all faculty must go through a training session about sexism, more, more sexualist harassment, and uh, how it must be recognized by the individual him or herself, women went through this too, and how important it is in the way that we treat our students. And uh, of course, Yale is a private institution. Uh, but I think that if we can, because it's truly devastating for students to discover that their own teachers, who are authority figures, are, uh, are uh, anti Semitic or racist. And uh, that, that has to be addressed publicly. I, I want to comment on that. That's such an important point, Paula. In the Jewish women's study, one of the findings was, <coughs> first there were focus groups and then there were individual interviews from across the country, that anti-Semitism was much worse than sexism. And this, was, this came out over and over. It was a very, very clear finding. But one of the reasons that women said that was the case was that sexism is part of the public discourse on TV, on India, etc. Anti-Semitism still isn't. And one woman actually said, 
we're still cringing, we're still cowering, we still can't talk about it in public except to other Jews, how far have we really come? And I think that kind of, I mean, and I have a whole, I wouldn't even say pet peeve, it's much more than a pet peeve. Uh, I wrote this paper years ago, which I thought by now would be completely out of date, uh, called Putting Anti-Semitism on the Anti-Racism Agenda, I don't remember, in Schools of Social Work in North America, published in 1980-something. And it's still an issue, schools of social work, and not to trash my own, it, it's not just mine, it's, it's um, many, many disciplines. Uh, you, you teach racism, sexism, ableism, heterosexism, and anti-Semitism is just not taught as part of anti-racism or anti-oppression, and I've been trying to make this happen. And the resistance is unbelievable, including from my Jewish colleagues. They find it too difficult, it's too painful. I don't want to, quote, come out as a Jew in front of my class. Yeah. Uh, as a footnote to this, Erwin Cutler is actually writing a, an article on, on uh, anti-Semitism denial. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of that, can, that contemporary anti-Semitism is not dealt with. Um, yeah, and I mean, USA is the first research center at North American University. So, uh, what you do there. Um, so I'm actually from Toronto, and I went through the Toronto <laughs> Jewish school system. Yes. So this is really, really interesting for me. Um, one question I actually had um, is, you said there was no difference, and I actually, we're actually good family friends with one of the girls, so I, I know her. Oh. Um, <laughs> which is, which is, don't I say don't, anything. I, I thought I would wrong. see her in a movie, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but she is a movie star. <laughs> now she's she arrived. Me. Yeah. Um, but so you said that, that there was no difference between the girls that went to Jewish school and didn't go to Jewish school. But did you look at all in terms of the difference which schools they went to? Just because I know that mm -hmm. the schools in Toronto, they're very, there are some very different schools, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. depending on, For sure. For uh, sure. I went to Associated, yeah. I, but yeah. like, you know, the kids that would go there versus we'd go to the more orthodox schools. Right. More. Did you look at, was yeah. there any yeah, uh, results of that at all? Well, you know, in terms of analyzing the data, I, had, I ended up with an N of 14 cases. So you, you're not doing you're not doing quantitative analysis. But yeah, I looked at the whole thing. I had um, it was about half the girl. Okay, there, in terms of religious affiliation, about half were conservative Jews, um, a third were Orthodox, and the other there were a couple of Reform and then other other meaning secular humanist, traditional egalitarian, or other. Um, and then in terms of the schools, the, the Jewish schools were represented Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. Um, and the Tivot, for example, uh, I don't know if you call it ultra-Orthodox. Uh, it's, well, they consider themselves modern Orthodox, but in the right. summer the girls are covered down to here and wear stockings, so it's not the same modern Orthodox as another school I'm thinking of. Um, I don't say that with any uh, criticism, I'm just trying to be really clear on what that school is like. Um, and it, it was a really big surprise to me and to my research assistant actually um, t that there were no differences between the girls from Mitivot and the reform girls or the secular humanist girls in any of the criteria that I looked at in anything. It was it was really striking and her, it, you know, there are all sorts of I don't know, feel sort of cliche to say you know they were their Canadian identity or their female identity. They were all interested in clothes. It was amazing to see them in the focus groups. And the final focus group, actually, the girl, the girl who was saying those anti-Orthodox type comments and the Orthodox girl sitting next to her, obviously you didn't get to see the whole focus group. At the end of the focus group, the, the conversation had come around to talking about clothes. And ultimately, who cares what you wear? It's who you are inside. And then the girl who had started off by attacking how orthodox girls dress because you think your body's ugly sort of had this moment of, oh, so it doesn't matter. And the two girls looked at each other and became friends and took a lift home with each other. And they, they lived a block apart. So I don't know, maybe that sort of anecdotal thing explains something. But I also went to great lengths in the focus school. I buddied people out <coughs> with quote the opposite types, you know, I mean, she, I, I had a personal agenda, which when she, perhaps, I was gonna say you shouldn't in research, it's important just to be open about your agendas in research. Uh, I really wanted to um, 
help overcome the stereotypes within the Jewish community, actually. And uh, at least within that little group, it seemed to happen informally. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Alan, and then you, and then we have about 10 more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more of an observation or, or a comment that was sort of interesting to the, the remark, uh, the remarks, et cetera, when Shirley Chisholm was running for president. And she made a comment that she found that sexism was more of a problem for her than racism. And uh, the contrast with, with, with the, that, that, that uh, anti-Semitism is, is, is worse than sexism now. I wonder if Shirley Chisholm would have the same comment today, but have other things have changed. Let's go back to the White House first. Uh, I wanted to um, say something about what you told and this. Um, yes, sorry. Yes, I wanted to. Um, and this, you you told that they rated their. I don't know how they felt like from ten to zero to ten about your life. Right. If so you they said in generally, I feel like ten bad because of anti-Semitism. Like eight. Um, I'm from Germany, not Jewish, um, went also to public schools, and um, when I thought about how I was at this age, um, I think I would have done the same, maybe for other reasons, but it was the time when I, I don't know, became aware of wars in the world and hunger and whatever, and I think, and I highly um, identified with these things, um, we also um, had I think the first time we were taught about Holocaust was fifth or sixth grade about. And I think I would have done the same. So I would question a little bit if this is really about Jewish identity or just the age. Well, that's interesting. I mean, they had the option. This was a, an open-ended question, as they say. I didn't say, oh, is it because of anti-Semitism? There were other girls who lowered life scores for other reasons. I mean, I didn't express that data because it's not relevant to the question of the effects of anti-Semitism. Uh, one girl changed schools and mm -hmm. she wasn't happy and she said, you know, um, you know, normally I'm a happy person but I'm going to give my life like, I don't know, a five because I'm really lonely. I, I don't have friends here. I wish we hadn't moved. Why did my parents make us move? You know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think I think kids have all sorts of concerns beyond themselves, particularly, I don't know, about 10. I found more with the, at 11, 12, they began to look around the world. I found, I don't think most, the 10 year olds at least that I interviewed didn't seem incredibly worried about the world as a whole. This sort of seemed to be their issue. But um, they, t they were the ones who explained why they lowered the score. Uh, and you're right, that may be something kids do, but they haven't explained it exactly that way, so. Yeah, but you also asked these questions, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't ask about hunger or whatever, and I'm, I, I don't know, I'm no, quite sure enough. that, that um, you would have got similar, similar results if in another setting. Well, I also asked about being a girl. Is yeah. anything bad about being a girl? Uh, one girl was upset. She did want to be a basketball player. <laughs> and she didn't say she's lowering her life score because of that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the other thing is, remember that um, these were all girls who said this after that weekend. Mm -hmm, yeah. No one said it before the weekend. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's, again, one has to always be very careful interpreting data, and that's a good question. But that was just such a compelling coincidence, you know, five out of five. I want to ask a question. Actually. So I, I, ho I hope you do an international study on this. I think it's very important. Um, do you think there'd be a difference between Canadian young Jewish girls and American young Jewish girls? Because mm -hmm. of, in Canada, you say no. In Canada, no, no, I'll, I'll shake oh. in <laughs> because in Canada, <clears throat> there's a strong sense of multiculturalism, of community, communal identity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's celebrated more, I would say, in the melting pot kind of uh, model, which, mm -hmm. now these are not black and white cases, yeah, but, but, but it has an impact. Mm -hmm. 
And I think there's higher levels of assimilation in the United States and in Canada. Do you think that that would play, that these issues would be a factor? Well, it's certainly a, a question. I, I would ask the same question you're asking, and, I, and for the same reasons. And I w I'm also very curious about other countries. I mean, I wonder about England, I wonder about yeah. Europe, I wonder about <coughs> Israel. Israel yeah. also is interesting, you know. Um, it, it very well might be different. I'd love to find out if it is. I hope you do. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. A final comment. We have like two minutes, and we have to leave. One last question. <coughs> Do you happen to know if in Canada uh, studies comparable to yours have would have been done with non-Jewish kids to assess what their attitudes at age nine or ten or eleven were toward Jewish children, the only and, and where it might emanate from? Mm -hmm. How do they acquire those? Those, yeah. those feelings. Well, I have to say, you know, I could have missed something. I mean, the world is large. But I did numerous lit searches. And in fact, I did one, the same lit search again a couple of weeks ago, just in case one day before I got here, or like two weeks before, you know. <coughs> There's almost nothing on this stuff, which is part of what I found so shocking. The one study I found that dealt uh, with Jewish children was in England. It was Jeffrey Short, um, who's a guy who's concerned about anti-Semitism, and it was how non-Jewish children look at Jewish children. And it's old, it's 85 or 80-something. Um, and what was interesting was the breakdown of, of um, different kinds of ignorance. What was religious? They killed Christ. Did that necessarily mean they didn't like Jews? Not necessarily. It was actually a complex, um, there wasn't sort of a simple kind of result that you could summarize, but it was interesting that he did that. I don't know anything of like it like that, and I there's tons on kids with racism and kids growing up with you know being bullied because they're gay or lesbian or whatever transgender. Anti-Semitism just is not on the radar. No, now it now it is, <laughs> but the next generation has to help. I mean, that's it, it's up to you guys. Yeah. Nora, thank you for coming. Thank you.